piano, um, but I'm lucky and fortunate to be kind of a guest co MC for today. I'm going to kind of kick off with a, a splash talk that looks a bit into the uh, cutting edge and future of health and medicine and the implications for all of us as, as individuals, patients, uh, investors, and entrepreneurs. And, you know, it's obviously a fast paced world today. Technology is moving very, very quickly. I'm going to speak quickly and try and cover a lot in 20 minutes. Uh, but as we think about the future, let's take a look back. You know, I was recently asked to write a little piece about the world in 2017. I thought, well, where were we in, you know, 2007, 10 years ago, you know, uh, the term quantified self was formed just here in the Bay Area. Now there's quantified self meetups around the world. We weren't really in that era. You know, uh, the first Fitbit launched only in 2009. Twitter only launched in 2007. Back, you know, 13 years ago, I was doing some work with NASA, building some of the first wearable devices to detect uh, body physiology that we're going to find space station. Huge devices now fit on our wrists. So a lot's changed since the last decade, and of course, we all now have technologies that have almost disappeared into our clothes, into our into our environments that can start to measure physiology and impact healthcare. Um, and again, those don't just measure physiology; it's our behaviors and many other components that we can use in health and medicine. A lot of these technologies, of course, are riding our magical supercomputers in our pocket. Ten years ago, 2007, the first real smartphone, the iPhone, launched. Think how different the world has been and how little you might have predicted what could be done on these mobile platforms. And because these are really healthcare devices, and I uh, come from near Cupertino, I have a sneak peek, don't tweet this, of the, with the uh, 2000, uh, sorry, or this is the old iPhone 1, which used to feel sexy and hot, now it's slow and clunky. If you had to imagine what the iPhone 10 were going to look like, how you'd apply that in healthcare. Here's a sneak peek of the 10 and the 11. Uh, don't, don't tell anybody. Um, so as we move forward into this fast-paced future, of course, I want you to be thinking exponentially. Moore's law is why our smart computers are moving faster and more and, and so inexpensively. And if you start thinking exponentially and convergently, that's where the opportunity for things to disrupt healthcare, what we'll be talking about today, are so, are so incredible. Um, our minds are linear. 30 linear steps, I'll be the exit, but 30 exponential steps gets you to a billion. That would be 26 times around the planet. That's the power of Moore's Law and many technologies that, you're shrink, that are shrinking and can apply in healthcare as well. So what if, with that exponential and convergent mindset, we can maybe get out of the old silos and buckets of how we've defined uh, physiology and medicine. Medicine's been practiced sometimes in the same way for hundreds of years by old body part definitions. And we're now in this exponential age, this connected age, this digital age. We can rethink this as we move forward. So in our sick care era today, we're really based most of our information on intermittent data, the occasional blood pressure check, EKG. Uh, you might still be faxing or PDF data from your blood pressure cuff or glucometer to your doctor, whether they wanted to see it or not. We're still in many places using the cutting edge fax machine to communicate. You know, and we're now again in 2017. We can think differently. We can be much more, instead of reactive, waiting for the heart attack, stroke, or in my world of oncology, uh, tumors to develop at late stage or uh, detect them at late stage, we can think about leveraging technology to be much more continuous and proactive, which I think will be a theme about many of the startups and technologies and folks will be hearing and meeting today on the Vader Splash stage. We always want to think about patient-centered care, but technology can sometimes get in the way. We're spending now as physicians twice as much time typing medical records than FaceTime with our patients. The EMRs today are often an epic fail, pun intended, and we need to uh, think about smarter ways, not just of the triple aim, better outcomes, lower costs, et cetera, but the quadruple aim, making healthcare not more click boxes for the doctor, nurse, or pharmacist, but to improve the experience for all of us in health and medicine before the burnout issue becomes even worse. So let's shift from sick care to health care. Part of that is, of course, the incentives, not just the technology. We're practicing more, uh, not evidence-based medicine, but reimbursement-based medicine in today's world. And that, of course, is starting to shift. You know, the uh, value-based system, outcomes are going to be the new incomes. We're going to get paid for apps, devices, technologies when they work, not just for prescribing them. Um, and so when you're thinking about disruption and convergence and secure to healthcare. It's not just the Moore's Law and IT that's getting faster. It's everything from 3D printing to AI to nanotech to low-cost genomics that are coming together. And many of the entrepreneurs we're going to meet today and, and um, startups are leveraging these in new ways as we move forward. I get a lens on this whole realm. I chair medicine at Singularity University since it started. And six years ago, I started a program called Exponential Medicine to bring folks together from across the spectrum. Most physicians go to very siloed conferences. It's been very interesting now. We've grown to about 600 people every fall at the Hotel Dell to have folks doing demos with 60 startups, meeting folks from across the spectrum. Everyone wants scrubs, scrubs for a day. We even can take a picture with now a $100 drone, which would have been not even available for $10 million 10 years ago uh, as we sort of think about catalyzing the future. So as we get exponentially cheaper, we're now seeing the point that our laptop can essentially fit on a computer 
the size of a grain of rice. And those, are, of course, are being connected. The Internet of Things coming to the Internet of Healthcare, the Internet of Medical Things. And now in a few years, I, I work, do some work with Qualcomm Life. Qualcomm's going to launch 5G, which is about 100 times the, the speed and, uh, of our current uh, 4G network. So what might you build on top of that type of platform? Um, we can then think about how shifting where healthcare happens. No longer in the four walls of the intensive care unit, the ICU, uh, the ER. We're increasingly taking care from the hospital to the home to the phone to into and on -site, inside our bodies. So where healthcare happens is quite disruptive. And with that change, you know, we're still often, uh, I like to call it, still stuck in incremental medicine. We're still waiting on average 66 minutes for that 12-minute primary care visit, whether you're here in San Francisco or in Calcutta. We have the opportunity to change that model. And that disruption is starting to come. Uh, in England, the NHS, National Health Service, is starting to pay for connected devices, wearables, glucometers, uh, blood pressure cuffs. Uh, we're seeing the evolution of our wearables from our wrists, from sort of 1.0 versions to 3.0. Sensors can even shrink into pills to track adherence. We're seeing blood pressure cuffs now getting FDA, FDA approved that fit into your actual watch. Or in the whole world of diabetes, which we'll touch on today in later sessions, glucometers now can talk to your smartwatch, or through digital tattoos, or even watches that might have glucometers actually built into them as well. So lots of these technologies are converging, all the way to, to the point where on the market today are little smart band-aids that are basically an intensive care unit on a patch. That's a lot of data. Who owns that data? Who's liable for it? How do we make sense of that? How do we connect the dots as we take that forward? Um, so just a few examples of other things that are sort of emerging. Uh, of course, there's wearables for your, for your shoe, maybe to track the risk of someone falling. We're in the era of shock uh, of uh, of shockables, uh, it might give you other impetus to change. Hearables, our hearing devices don't just play music, they can track steps and heart rate. Ringables, I'm wearing this Aura ring out of Finland that does an amazing job of tracking sleep, which is so important for health and wellness and maybe even being uh, good entrepreneurs. We're in the era now of, of breathables. You know, breath is a biomarker. A uh, local company, Breathometer, can track the quality of your breath. We're seeing that advent with sort of nano noses to maybe pick up lung cancer and other diseases from molecules in your breath. Sweatables might help you with your triathlon, but they also might help manage patients with heart disease or renal failure in the near future. Shockables, again, for diabetes to measure their, their feet health. Um, we can adapt wearables on our wrist to track tremor and maybe adjust medications for Parkinson's patients. Lots of ways to take these technologies and use them in new ways. And as these dissolve into our clothes and our environments, we'll be using these to manage not just running triathlons, but heart failure, emphysema, and other chronic diseases in hopefully more seamless ways. Okay, poopables, all these things are here. Here's an even interesting one. Uh, maybe someone has a risk of fall, which has a, a big, um, more, oops, mortality issue. What if you had sort of a... Uh, a wearable airbag. I just met this company out of, out of Israel, sort of another sort of concept that, that may be applicable to some folks in the not so distant future. Um, so we're, can, we're starting to be able to quantify our brain. We have, you know, consumer grade uh, brain computer interfaces. I might prescribe to a patient to gamify mindfulness. Whereas Adam Gasly at UCSF and team are using to gamify uh, everything from cognition to mental issues. We're going from just wearables to this idea of insidables, contact lenses from our friends at Google, Google Health, Verily, partnering with Big Pharma to bring uh, technology onto our eyeball, again, for diabetes care. Or uh, chips underneath the skin. This local company, Profusa, has CE mark on a device that can measure perfusion and soon potassium and magnesium underneath the skin in real time. So we're really going to start to enter an era where we're always online with our data. How about not just getting the data, but getting a nudge, the idea of trainables. This is the upright device out of Israel in our world today of smartphone postures. We can now uh, use these elements to potentially trigger us to, uh, this buzzes your back when you're out of alignment. And about a week of wearing this for an hour a day, retrains your physiology. Might help you with lower back pain or other issues. Um, bloom technologies, the whole area of health tech coming to pregnant women and young children is exploding with, when there's time to go to the hospital with contractions. And when that bundle of joy is born, this used to be a joke, Wired Magazine connected diapers, that was kind of science fiction. Really, it's here. Huggies came out with Tweet Pee a couple years ago, and there's data for other elements. And we can, I'm a pediatrician by training, we can use these technologies to send kids home earlier from the intensive care unit, for example, and measure their physiology. This is my son, Leo, doing his part for medicine, wearing his connected onesie. I don't need that to let me know he's waking up every two hours, but it might be useful in certain clinical settings, measuring temperature from binkies, how much milk a child is drinking. It's a lot of data. When is it too much? How do you, as a pediatrician or a parent, uh, make sense of this in useful ways? 
One other area we can start to quantify, which is incredibly important, is mental health. We've done better with other diseases, but suicide rates are up. We can use our smartphones and our voice as a biomarker for picking up emotional states. You can download apps like Moody's and figure out whether your friend, uh, boss, spouse is really happy with you or not and start to quantify emotional states. We can even use voice as a biomarker, as they've done with Mayo Clinic, to pick up heart disease from changes in voice. Voice can also predict things like uh, neurologic disorders. So think about other things we can quantify. And as these things come together, we're starting to see science fiction, the Star Trek Tricorder come to reality. I've been involved with the XPRIZE for many years. I helped design and launch a Tricorder XPRIZE, which is about four years in. Several hundred teams entered the competition. A couple of local ones you may have heard of, you know, Scanadu actually crowdfunded their clinical trial. And these devices can track things like temperature, blood pressure, heart rate uh, calculated, O2 sat, talk to your smartphone. Other ways of doing smart analytics for your analysis can come to your smartphone. Not bringing your urine to the lab, but doing the dipstick and quantifying it with your camera sending that data to your doctor, to the CDC, to the NSA, whoever else wants that information, all available. Um, so there's a lot of new folks coming to the space. Again, the finals for this will be in a, uh, a couple, uh, a month from now. Um, and this brings us, of course, to part of the theme of today, digital health. We can start to connect the dots between these technologies and devices, not just the vital sign pieces, but other elements and stuff to hopefully make sense of them. We still have huge challenges. Most data centers and EMRs and pharma and academics, their data doesn't talk to each other. We need to unleash that, some of that information going forward and dr drive disruptive business models. You know, everyone used to say the Uber, want to be the Uber of this or that, not great uh, press maybe this last month, but even Uber smartly has done pilots like Uber Health. Press a button and a nurse comes to you to give you a flu shot. We're seeing the Uberization of doctor calls uh, with many startups locally. We uh, press a button and a doctor comes to you. Not sure what kind of doctor you get, but you get a doctor. And they can rate you and you can rate them. Uh, we're in the advent of, of course, all these companies around here have been disruptive, and the trick is no one wants to be the next you know, Kodak. You want to Uber yourself before you get Kodak. And I think that's part of what many of the uh, startups and, and, and investors are here today are, are doing across healthcare. We're even seeing companies that have been disrupted, like Nokia, they don't make cell phones anymore, come on digital health, acquired WeThings, and are now uh, creating devices uh, to ramp across consumer uh, to advance care. So it's a bit of a so what now, but a true issue that we're going to start to be online with our health data all the time. What do we, what do, we do with all that information? It's a, you know, terabytes of data potentially per day. How do we make sense of that? Whether it's our digital health data, our genomics data, we're now at the era of a $1,000 genome. The price of sequencing is dropping at twice the rate of Moore's law, soon to be $100. What happens if you bring your genome to your doctor? What do they know what to do with it? Beyond that, there's the proteome, the exposome, the microbiome is a hot issue today. Companies like Ubiome here, you can sequence your microbiome for, for $80. So now it's becoming not the sort of you know, data issue, it's the information challenge. How do we make it actionable information in the clinic? Because there's all these new sources, there's no way any of us as consumers, as physicians, as, as um, entrepreneurs can keep up. And that might mean we can shift the model from just looking at double-blind, randomized controlled trials, you know, evidence-based medicine, to true intelligence-based medicine, pulling the inf information in from all sorts of sources. Because it's going to be a so what if you have to keep charging your device, if that data can't flow to your clinician, if the clinician has to look at the raw data and can't extract the right components. So we really need to work as we design these solutions to be accessible, digestible, and actionable, not just data for the sake of data. So part of this new information might get synthesized. You might look at your mirror in the morning and see your digital coach giving you a health score, integrating all sorts of information. Again, these sensors are becoming integrated. The Apples, the Samsungs, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world are starting to integrate these data into our consumer devices that we touch hundreds or thousands of times a day. So using that data, we can be actionable. We can change incentives. Uh, we're seeing uh, some insurance companies lower your premium if you can run an eight-minute mile, or uh, with a wearable device giving monetary uh, rewards to folks. So whole new business models will open up now with these incentives um, for changing behavior. And again, these incentives aren't one size uh, fits all. The empowered patient. You can be the co-pilot of a care. Your own, hopefully, your data. You can opt into sharing it. And the coaches that will help us change that information are becoming ubiquitous. Amazon Echo, Google Home are going to become healthcare platforms, helping you figure out how much insulin to take, doing your refills, or Alexa, help, I fall and I can't get up, new ways to access care. Chatbots are kind of exploding, embedded with AI to maybe help do early triage. You can chat with these on Facebook today. This is not the future. These will be the first part of your care. These all, however, need to work into our workflow. So when you're designing solutions, talk to the clinicians and the nurses and the pharmacists. And don't just make it another checkbox, another app to have to open. It may never be adopted. 
And where I think this is all heading, as I mentioned, quantified self is only a 10-year-old term, is we're moving from quantified self to quantified health. We're going to start to connect these dots back to our clinicians and healthcare systems. That's starting to happen. In the last year with your Apple uh, uh, Health Kit data, you can see your data on your phone, but now I can connect that into my medical record at Stanford, and my doctor can see that data. He sends me a little note. I've got your steps, heart rate, and weight data. It looks good. I'm like, my doctor's watching my data? Whoa, I might change my behaviors just because I know he's watching. And he doesn't want to log in to 2,000 patients a day. He wants to have a ping of the 10 patients in his clinic or his 2,000 patients he cares for that need care. So that needs design thinking. How do you import this information? How do you make it actionable, useful to every individual? We're seeing examples of Apple inspired new stores, uh, new uh, digital health clinics like Forward, which just launched here a couple months ago, with new ways of interacting with that data and even sending folks home with wearable devices that can flow. So smart design uh, in one example right there. We can integrate all this health information and give you a, a FICO score for your health to make sense of it, a wellness index. And where I think this is all heading is hopefully predict analytics, giving you information proactively, just like our modern cars have hundreds of sensors in them. You don't care about any one sensor. You care when your check engine light goes on. That check engine light uh, element and the systems that go on top of the hundreds of sensors are maybe a bit of the theme. Do you want to build a hardware company or the software that's going to layer on top and make sense of this? And we can take, uh, this, speaking of check engine lights for the body, published out of Stanford, my colleague uh, Dave, uh, Mike Snyder is one of those quantified guys on the planet. His wearable technologies gave him a clue that he had Lyme disease before he even knew it. His technologies which sensed him uh, picked up early type 2 diabetes and showed an incredible uh, path of that. So we can really start to understand disease proactively and in the setting of a lot of inf information as we go forward. And back to the car theme, the Teslas of today update themselves. What if our maps of the future could update themselves? Going from sort of our normal maps of health to high precision ones, just like Teslas inform other Teslas around them and they improve with each update. One example of that might be using genomics now. Thousands of type 2 diabetics being sequenced, applying machine learning and AI, we can now subset them into three distinct subtypes and understand how they respond to diet, exercise, and other interventions. So subsetting disease. And when you have disease, we could have coaches. Like Vita, we'll hear from uh, Stephanie Tolinius later, our coaches for health and wellness. But we're going to see coaches that branch into chronic disease and acute disease management. Lark was a great AI coach that you can download today and remind you whether you need to work on your exercise, your sleep, I think will meld into the chronic disease space. These coaches are coming in robotic form into our Snapchats and beyond. And that means we can access care, coaching or clinical care from anywhere. We're in the era of, of telehealth, not on the telephone, not just on your smart app, but in many realms. And that can be overlaid with digital layers for every drug and device in clinical conditions. And we're starting to see that, see that these have ROI. Mayo Clinic published that they could lower heart failure readmissions by 40% with an app and connected devices. We're seeing that blood pressure can be better controlled, which crosses so many diseases with a low-cost connected blood pressure cuff and a wearable. We're seeing the advent, of course, of Augmented reality, this is already an antique. Augmented reality plays a role in whole realms. We'll hear from Augmedics later. There's uh, these being used in the clinic and the operating room uh, now to teach medical students or train for procedures. A whole set of ways we can see surgeons using augmented reality. The folks from Tet Surgery are here from today out of London. We can do augmented training with our tablets or HoloLens devices, so try those things out in the demo room. All sorts of ways we're gonna change education Recent work out of Stanford, you can learn as a medical student, you know, uh, complex cardiac diseases, all by going into these live environments, walking inside the heart. So medical education, both for patients, physicians, nurses, and others, is set to dramatically change using some of these exponential technologies that are converging. Even using smart blended reality, you can uh, have fun ways of learning anatomy on yourself, or your kids can do this as well. Uh, really engaging. My, my now three-year-old son, Leo, you know, knows where his heart heart and lungs are, and a little bit of the physiology by sort of seeing inside his body in real time. Um, VR, of course, is here. Expensive versions, low-cost versions, ways to use VR for therapy. We're starting to see uh, cold therapy for pain patients. They can go in a cold environment. They use less than half of the pain medications. We can make old clinical environments more exciting, uh, at least more relaxing in many ways. Um, so AR and VR has lots of applications. In the operating room, live stream surgeries, which I was at in London a few months ago, all the way to using your um, uh, Okay, clicker's not working. Um, Snapchat goggles and others that can be used in the operating room to, to record surgeries and, and apply them in interesting ways. So I'm gonna, you know, I just got these the other day, so I'm going to use them. Um, so all these technologies can make health more engaging. You know, you can blend this AR, VR on your runs. Pokemon Go is really, a, sorry, is a healthcare game. 2,000 more steps on average walked by Pokemon players and others. And we can tune these behavior changes to the individual. That's not one size fits all. We don't need to be wearing the same wearable, have the same app, it needs to match your age, location, personality. And with genomics, 
There's even genomics that relate to personality. Helix is just being launched, a, a platform for understanding complex elements like athletic genes or risk for diseases. Diagnostics is melding into all of this. We now have a whole new set of doctor digital tools we can use um, that are moving forward and integrating. Uh, we're going to throw away the stethoscope and have connected ultrasounds. Our AI is going to blend in and disrupt some clinical fields. The eye exam now can be done on mobile devices, even the back of the eye. And Google and others are applying machine learning to understand the back of the eye and diabetic retinopathy. Or AI pathologists that can do a better job than pathologists with unlimited time. How many pathologists do you know have unlimited time? We're seeing companies like Zebra Medicine integrate in major health plans that are going to be changing the way we do radiology and imaging. Lots of things happening in that space that are going to be powerful, including a Stanford spin out I advise, Arteris, that has the first uh, FDA approved sort of AI diagnostic platform for cardiac imaging. So these all worlds are moving quickly. I'm going to sort of close with uh, just reminding that. Um, feels like cancer. My world are changing quickly. It's not just about the technology. We want to blend new ways of thinking. Um, I'm involved in the new Cancer X Prize to develop low-cost cancer screening that hopefully will launch in about a year. So we'd love some of you to help on that platform, maybe join teams or support them uh, for a new Cancer X Prize. Um, and where this all comes together is integrating this in smart ways. We need to sort of connect the dots, right? There's no one way to make sense of this. AI is playing a role. It's not just AI versus doctor. It's going to be doing what physicians and humans do well versus what computers and other things do well. We're seeing whole new AI integrated platforms launched where you can integrate this today and apply this. So I'm going to cut to the chase here because I'm out of time, uh, which is um, just to sort of close with the idea that with all this information now, and 10 years ago, you couldn't have, you know, we were driving with paper maps. We're entering an era where we can crowdsource not just our driving. And you wouldn't imagine driving without Google Maps or Waze. We can start to crowdsource health. Donating your data can give you a healthcare map. And hopefully, you donate information, you get something back, just like we do when we drive today. I'm hopeful that as we move into this exponential future, we can all not just be organ donors and data donors, but data, uh, but, uh, data donors as well. And think convergently. Think where all these things are heading, how they can leverage exponentials. So don't think in 2017 terms as an entrepreneur. Think about, like Wayne Gretzky, where the puck will be in 2020, 2020, 2025. Uh, a lot can happen in a decade. And if we think exponentially and convergently, we can get out of our siloed, episodic, reactive sick care system to a true continuous participatory and proactive healthcare system uh, and healthcare world that we all contribute to. So, Think exponentially, not linearly. And with that, we can all go out and not predict the future, uh, but create it. So with that, I'll say thanks. And we're going to move to our, our next session. Thanks a lot.